this time, we're going to finish our answers with Ken Ham series as we watch video 12, part two of how can we evangelize a secular world? It's a very important topic because why did Jesus leave us here? It's to save others from hell, amen? And we're going to be talking about how we can evangelize this dark world. For the mat. Answers in Genesis and Cedarville College present Answers with Ken Ham A 12-part video series defending the Bible from the very first verse. Today's question, how can we evangelize a secular world? Part 2. And now, Ken Ham. In the last session on creation evangelism, we established the fact that uh, in our Western culture, it's changed from being like the Jews to being like the Greeks, and yet most churches are approaching our culture as if it's like the Jews, and that they understand the message of sin and, and repentance and so on without the foundation. That, that's the big problem uh, that we've established. In fact, let's go over those uh, castle diagrams once again just to explain this, because this really sums up the situation. I use this in many of my talks. Here's the problem. Here's the foundation of evolution. Man's word determines truth. Evolution is not just the idea of molecules to man, but that's really the justification people have for not believing in God and saying that man decides truth for himself. On well, that is built the castle of humanism. Those issues that come out of that, abortion, homosexual behavior, lawlessness, racism, school violence, and so on. In other words, the more people believe man decides truth, there's no basis for right or wrong except your own opinion. You could justify anything you want, ultimately. And then there's the foundation of creation. God's word uh, is truth. And there's the structure of Christianity. And what's happening is this, the humanists have been very, very clever. They know if you knock out the foundation of creation, and the, and the way to do that is start with uh, Genesis. If you knock out Genesis 1 to 11, you knock out the foundation of Scripture, foundation of, of the rest of, of Christianity, then once that foundation is gone, then there is no basis for the castle of Christianity. Christianity will collapse in a nation, the Christian fra fabric, the Christian, Christian frame, uh, framework. And so that's what we see happening. What are Christians doing? They recognize there's a problem. They shoot into nowhere, shoot at themselves, they shoot at their own foot by believing in millions of years and evolution and so on, take pot shots at the issues. But as I've repeatedly said, those issues like abortion and so on are not the problems. They're the symptoms of the problem. And we've had this change in foundation. And so what's happened is this. When you had the castle of Christianity, you had the foundation of God's word, and you would say, you sin or repent of your sin, sin people knew what sin was. When you said... Uh, that uh, abortion's wrong, they understood that on that foundation. But because we've changed foundation in our nations to, to man's word determining truth, uh, then when you say you sin or repent of your sin, they don't understand what sin is. When you say abortion's wrong, they say no it's not. And so that's why I have that second castle diagram, the solution. What we need to understand is that we need to be out there and restoring the foundation of the authority of the word of God, knocking out the wrong foundation, fighting those weapons and those issues all at the same time, Otherwise, we're not going to be successful. In other words, you can't change someone's thinking from the top down. It's got to change from the foundation up. And we need to see people converted to the Lord Jesus Christ and build their thinking on the Bible and then be salt uh, in our culture so that they can affect the world for Jesus Christ and make the right sorts of decisions. Now, establishing that, that there's been this change from one foundation to the other, which is uh, represented by what we're talking about, from being like the Jews to being like the Greeks, in essence, Acts 2, Acts 17, as we established in the last session. Let me give you a few observations just to uh, make this even more clear. You know, when I was a little boy in Australia back in the 1950s, so it was a late 1950s, and I was a really little boy, uh, <laughs> I remember when a famous evangelist came to Australia, and his major message was this, you sinners repent of your sin, trust in Jesus, and you know what? There were a lot, thousands of people who came to those crusades and the whole of Australia was buzzing. It's even been said by some that it was the closest Australia ever came uh, to revival. And, and yet, even though many people were truly converted, since that time many evangelists have come to Australia, but we don't see the same response. In fact, statistics that I've seen from where the crusades are conducted in America, England, Australia, 
the number of people who come forward, the number of true, real first-time conversions compared to generations ago is really quite small. A lot of people who come forward are already Christians or there for recommitment or, or whatever, but it, it's different to generations ago. It's different to, say, the times of Wesley and Moody and, and Whitfield and, and others in the past. So keep that at the back of your mind. I remember when my father was a school teacher and before students went into school in Australia, uh, they all had prayer, uh, Bible readings in each class, but that doesn't happen today uh, in Australia. Not like it certainly used to. I remember when, even as a teacher, when the Gideons came in to hand out Bibles to the students, I noticed a trend over the years, increasingly students not taking a Bible at the school, school that I was at. Yet when I was a kid, we all used to take one, basically without question. When, when, you, when you consider England, the first time I went to England, I was amazed. See, I always thought of England as sort of a Christian country. Uh, because you think of Spurgeon, you think of Whitfield and Wesley, and, and you think of some of the great revivals that you hear about over in nations like that. And it is true, uh, back before the last war, they say 40%, maybe higher, of the population attended church. But you go to England today, I think it's probably worse than Australia. The number attending church, a very small percentage. Yet generations ago in Australia and in England, people automatically sent their kids to Sunday school, didn't they? But it doesn't happen like that today. If you take America, generations ago, people automatically sent their children to church programs and so on. Prayer was in the school, Bible readings in the school, the Ten Commandments. Uh, but what's happened? Back in the 1960s, we, we started to see you know, prayer thrown out of the schools, Bible out of the schools, creation out of the schools. See, again, what I'm saying is this. Generations ago, people were familiar with... with Christian terms. People were familiar with the message of Christianity, familiar with, with sin and God and, and creation and why death was in the world and so on. They were like the Jews, but increasingly they become like the Greeks. And yet, most of the church still approaches them if they're like, as if they're like the Jews. A verse of scripture I'd like to bring to your attention is Jeremiah 4, 3. We read this, For thus saith the Lord to the men of Judah and Jerusalem, Break up your fellow ground and sow not among thorns. Break up your fellow ground and sow not among thorns. Now, I'm sure many of us are familiar with the parable of the sower and the seed. Read about in Matthew, for instance. And you know that when the sower threw out the seed, of course, understanding that parable, there's all sorts of different ground out there, but, but the point is, uh, he wanted the seed to grow so that you could reap a harvest. And so, for the seed to grow, you need a prepared ground, you need the right sort of ground there so that the seed could grow. I'd like to suggest to you that what's happening today is this, that... The church throwing out the seed doesn't recognize that there's very little prepared ground out there. In fact, they're out there throwing out the seed and the ground is basically rocks and thorns and very little prepared ground there. And, and they're saying, oh, this is the way we've always spread the gospel in the past. Wow, these weeds are getting worse every day. Oh, well, and I'd like to suggest to you that we don't understand what's happened is that the enemy has sown seeds of destruction. The rocks of evolutionary geology and the trees of evolutionary biology have taken over the, the, the plowed ground. There's very little proud plowed ground left. Increasingly, the plowed ground is disappearing and the church is out there throwing out the seed, not considering the ground that's out there, wondering why we're not seeing a massive change in our culture. They're looking at the problems, the social ills in our culture, abortion and so on, up there trying to fight those and, and say, this is wrong, you shouldn't do that, not realizing people aren't going to understand why it's wrong unless they've got a foundation from God's word. And that's why we're not being successful. You know, think about it. We spent millions of dollars in America trying to fight issues like abortion. Christians have spent millions and millions of dollars, but if we're honest, it really hasn't worked. Why not? Because abortion is not the problem. Doesn't mean you shouldn't stand up against these evils. Of course you should. But the problem is people's thinking has changed so they don't understand why it's wrong anymore. And there's this real clash between humanism and Christianity. And you see, we've got to recognize that that ground has disappeared, the plowed ground to be receptive to the gospel. And so what we see our ministry as is this. It's like a bulldozer, if you like. And I have a picture in which we have a bulldozer and coming in and knocking out trees and rocks and plowing the ground. And by the way, before we go on, I need to explain something. I had somebody come up to me at one seminar and, and accuse me of an anti-environmental picture because uh, I had a bulldozer knocking out trees. So I usually explain to my audience, the trees are symbolic, the rocks are symbolic, the bulldozer is symbolic, there's no owl in the tree, and, uh, <laughs> but, the, but the creationist in the bulldozer is real, okay? <laughs> So here we have a bulldozer. This is what our ministry is really all about. A bulldozer coming in, knocking out the trees, knocking out the rocks, plowing the ground. When the pioneers came to America, for instance, or people first you know, cross, crossed uh, the Blue Mountains in Australia, uh, before you can plant your crops, what have you got to do? 
You've got to plough the ground. You've got to prepare the ground. You've got to knock out the rocks. You've got to make sure it's fertilised and, and ready for the seed. Well, that's what we've got to recognise today as Christians. If we're going to go out and throw out the seed of the gospel, if the ground is not prepared, then what's going to happen? It's like the, like the parable of the sower and the seed. The, the, the ground is not there for the, for the uh, to seed to take root and to reap a harvest because it's basically been taken over by the enemy. And so our job today is what I call pioneer evangelism or pre-evangelism. We need to go out there and we need to be preparing the ground. You know what that means? It's like the ministry Paul had to the Greeks. It's hard work. You can't just go out there and say, you sinner, repent of your sin. They don't understand. You've got to start at a different place. You've got to knock out their wrong foundation, their wrong foundation of evolution. You've got to put in the right foundation of God's word. You've got to start with, with the history of the universe right from Genesis because they don't understand that anymore. They've lost that. They don't understand about Adam and Eve and the fall of man. They don't realize we're all descendants of one man and one woman. They don't understand what sin is. We have to start right at the very beginning and lay that foundation. You know, I've, I've met people in churches who come to me and said, you know, I became a Christian a couple of years ago. I, I really did understand I was, I was a sinner. There's something wrong and, I, and I, I trusted the Lord. But it wasn't until you came in and explained the gospel from Genesis that I really recognized what it was all about. It was like a light bulb starting in my head. In fact, one lady said to me, you know, for me, Christianity was like starting in the middle of a movie. You took me back to the beginning. Now I understand the plot. <laughs> wow, this, this, this makes sense. <laughs> you know, it's, um, it's like I say to some people, I, I remember uh, somebody who, who said to me, look, when you go out and preach the gospel, Genesis is not important, just tell them about Jesus. But if you go out there and tell them, trust in Jesus, well, who's Jesus? Well, he died for you. Why did he die? Because of your sin. Well, what is sin? Well, don't worry about, well, there's some stuff back in Genesis. Don't worry about that, just trust in Jesus. You know a problem I think we've got in our churches? Today I think there's a lot of easy believism. There's a lot of this emphasis of trust in Jesus. Come to Jesus. Jesus is going to solve all your problems. Come to Jesus. And I think there's a lot of people who've added Jesus in with all their other gods. And they don't understand the gospel. And if there's been, think about this. If you've never truly repented of your sin, never acknowledged a broken relationship between you and the Lord and understood that there's a broken relationship and never really repented of your sin and understood that foundational aspect of the gospel, if you just trusted in Jesus, whatever that means to you, do you think you can be truly saved? I think our churches are full of people today who have trusted in Jesus, added Jesus in, but, but Jesus is not Lord of their life because they don't understand sin. And if they've been influenced by the millions of years and look at all this death and suffering out there and that's been going on for millions of years, they don't understand the holiness of God, they don't understand what their sin has done to this world and, and they don't recognize that it's our sin that's responsible for this mess and, and they just trust in Jesus because they've got problems and hope that'll take it all away. That's why I think we have people in our churches who don't have a Christian worldview, who, who think it's okay to, to you know, not bother about getting married and we, we see... For instance, one of the, one of the uh, statistics indicates you know, the divorce rate uh, amongst people in the church seems to be higher in, in some instances than, than the world and so on. And we, and we see you know, the abortion rate is even high amongst, amongst girls who call themselves born-again Christians. And, well, why is this? Why is it that, that the church looks so much like the world? We talked about that in another program, that, that we don't see much difference between the standards in the church and the world. I think it's because there are many people who just trust in Jesus, whatever that means, but Jesus is really not Lord of their life. And they haven't changed their whole way of thinking from the foundation up, acknowledged their sin. See, I think we see this too, and I'll use another illustration. I think we give the, the world the wrong idea sometimes. You know that hymn, All Things Bright and Beautiful, The Lord God Made Them All. We, we go out there and we tell people, look at this beautiful world. Can't you see there's a wonderful God? Look how wonderful this world is. I got news for you. This is not a beautiful world. It's a pretty ugly world. We see people dying, children dying. We see violence. And, and, and just as we're recording this program, we hear about somebody who went into a, a church and shot people in a, in a youth group. And, and we hear about all this violence in the world and disease and suffering. And we see poisonous animals. And, and, and we say, oh, what a beautiful world. <laughs> well, it's not, is it? It's a pretty ugly world. Now, there's a remnant of beauty out there. But see, what we're seeing is a groaning world because of sin. But, but here is a problem. When you take a non-Christian, for instance, out to the Grand Canyon, you say, look, this beautiful canyon, can't you see there's a God? There's such a beautiful world. Well, the problem is, if they're looking through a telescope of understanding that death has been here for millions of years and so on, and they're looking at this world and they say, what do you mean a beautiful world? 
death and struggle and disease and suffering for millions of years. I don't see a beautiful world. I don't see a God of love. What are you talking about? See, it's only the person who has on those biblical glasses, starting from a literal genesis, who looks through a, 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 a telescope or glasses explaining, ah, it was a perfect world, but we and Adam rebelled, and sin entered the world, and death is a consequence. It's a groaning world, and God is a God of love, because he sent his son to die for us and be raised from the dead. It's only in that, when you have that understanding and those sets of glasses, that you'll be able to look out there and say, I see a God of love. Woe is me. Look what my sin has done to this world. You see, that, that's the same problem between the Jews and the Greeks. When you go out to people today and say, there's a God of love, trust in a God of love. If they don't understand the foundation of history from the Bible, beginning with Genesis, they will not see our God of love. And Greeks will not understand that, if you know what I mean. It's only those who are Jews in that sense of having that right foundation that are going to understand that. And understand, therefore, Romans 8.22, the whole of creation groans and travaileth in pain. You know, I, I saw a quote a little while ago. I don't know what this person believes about Genesis. I, I just have no idea. But it's a recognition that the church understands something is wrong. And this person, who is from a group of uh, evangelical Christians, said this, The environment in which we now exist is one in which there is no knowledge of the Bible and its stories which were learned at grandmother's knee. We must learn how to communicate to a society that has no Christian background at all. And I know that increasingly there are people who understand that in the church, but I often find those people still don't understand the real foundational nature of the problem because they still think you can believe in millions of years and evolution and Genesis is not important. But this is where the real battle is at and that's what they need to come to grips with. But you see, we have another problem. You know what it is? Sadly, not only the culture as a whole is more like the Greeks than the Jews, most of the people sitting in our churches are Greeks and not Jews. Now, you know what I mean by that? You know, I've been in this ministry now for going on 25 years, actually, full-time for 20 years or so. And I get on Christian radio a lot. I have done literally hundreds of Christian talk shows. 14 years ago, for instance, when I was in America and did a Christian talk show, guess what questions they asked? I remember back 14 years. <laughs> you know why? Because <laughs> I get asked the same questions today. That's why. <laughs> you know what questions I was asked? Where did Cain get his wife? Where did the races come from? What about the days of creation? How did Noah get all the animals on the ark? What about carbon dating? How did dinosaurs fit with the Bible? You know, 13 years ago when I did talk shows, do you know what questions I was asked? Where did Cain get his wife? Where did the dinosaurs come from? How do they fit with the Bible? How did Noah get the animals on the ark? What about carbon dating? What about the days of creation? Can Christians believe in evolution? Guess what questions I was asked 12 years ago on talk shows? Where did Cain get his wife? How did dinosaurs fit with the Bible? How did Noah get the animals on the ark? Now, I'm not saying they're stupid questions or anything. They're important questions. And, and I, I love answering them for people. But, you know, if I get on a Christian talk show next week and the interviewer says to me, what questions do you think you'll be asked? Where did Cain get his wife? What about the races of people? How did dinosaurs fit with the Bible? How did Noah get the animals on the app? What about carbon dating? In fact, I did two uh, talk shows this week already. You know what questions I was asked? Where did Cain get his wife? Where... <laughs> but do you know what that tells you? See, this is what it tells me. In one of the other programs, I mentioned that back at the time of the Scopes trial in 1925, William Jennings Bryan, who stood for Christianity, was asked, where did Cain get his wife? What about the days of creation? By the ACLU lawyer, and he couldn't answer the questions. We haven't learnt the lessons. We haven't learnt to defend our faith. You see, the world is asking those questions. Why? Because if you can't answer them, how can you defend the Bible? How, how can you defend Christianity? How, how, how can you defend your Christian faith? You, you, can't, you can't answer these simple questions. It also tells me that the church, the church is not answering those questions. Do you know what I believe is happening in our church? I believe we've disconnected the Bible from the real world. You see, in education, in America, for instance, in the schools, they've thrown God out of education, disconnected God from science. But in our churches, we've disconnected science from God. See, a lot of people think the Bible is just a religious book and just about uh, salvation and Jesus, and it is that, but it's much more than that. It's the history book of the universe. It tells us about the major events of history that we need to understand to build a foundation, to build our thinking, so we have a way of explaining dinosaurs, as we've already done uh, in this series. It's important to understand that. And you know what we need to be doing in our churches? Connecting the Bible to the real world and showing people that the Bible connects to death, to suffering, to fossils, to trees, to biology, to geology, it, it connects to who we are. You see, what we tend to do is we just teach the Bible as Bible stories. Let me explain what I mean. I think in many instances, our youth group studies today, Sunday school studies, Bible studies, 
in a sense, in essence, please understand what I'm saying here, don't get me wrong, but they're almost, in a sense, a waste of time. You know why I'm saying that? We teach Bible stories, Bible stories, Bible stories, Bible stories. What do I mean? Jonah and the great fish, feeding of the 5,000, Paul's missionary journeys. But they're important. They're important accounts. Absolutely. My parents talked them to me. We need to believe them. Absolutely. But here's the problem. We just teach the Bible like that, and then our kids go out into the big bad world. You know what happens out there? They're being taught through the media, through the schools, through the colleges, through the books they read. But you can't trust the Bible. Science has proved the Bible wrong. How did Noah get all the animals on the ark? There never was a global flood. Dinosaurs proved millions of years anyway. How do you know there was a God? Everything happened by, by evolutionary processes. Look at all these ape men we've got. And we know the world's billions of years old. You know what we do in our churches? Bible stories, Bible stories, Bible stories. We're not connecting the Bible to the real world. They go out into the real world. The real world disconnects the Bible from the real world and says, ah, we can explain all these things. You can't explain them. And so our children grow up thinking, oh, the Bible's a collection of stories over here. The real world is out here, millions of years and all this evolutionary stuff and so on. And we've not connected the Bible to the real world and we wonder why we lose them. You see, if you were to tell somebody who's been teaching Sunday school for 40 years, Mrs. Brown, yes, you need to be teaching science in your Sunday school lessons. What? No, we teach the Bible at church. See, that's the problem. That's the mentality today in our church. Oh, we just teach the Bible. We need to teach the Bible as a history book, connecting it to reality. That's what we seem to have missed. We've disconnected the Bible from reality. And you know, if I can be so bold as to say this, you could be the best preacher in the world, preach starting with Genesis, beautifully, every verse, in context, tremendous exegesis of Scripture, verse by verse, but, it, but if, if that's all we do, you're not reaching the people in the pews. Because then they go home and, oh yeah, I had a great Bible study today. Now, let's live in the real world. And you see, they're sitting in the pews there, where did Cain get his wife? How, where the races of people come from? What do we do with dinosaurs? Look, when I go into most churches, one of the most asked questions concerns dinosaurs. You know why? They're taking man's interpretation of dinosaurs, going to the Bible and saying, how do we fit with this with the Bible? H how, do we, how do we do this? Because the Bible is a religious book over here, disconnected from the real world. We should be starting with the Bible. It's a history book. Look at major events of history. Origin of death, origin of animals, the flood of Noah and so on. Once you build your thinking on that and go out and connect it to the real world, what a difference it makes. And then people start to recognize that Christianity is not just trusting Jesus, and, 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 and certainly is that, and Jesus being Lord of our life, but it's a whole way of thinking. And we've lost that way of thinking in our churches. In fact, I have a little series of cartoons here to sort of sum this up, if I may. Here's, uh, here's little Johnny, if you like. Goes to school Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and he's, he's hearing, evolution's true, the Bible's wrong. Evolution's true, the Bible's wrong. Sadly, even in some Christian schools, they hear that, by the way, which is pretty sad. But not in all, of course. And then on Sunday, he goes along to church. Ah, oh, not another Bible story. This is boring. You know, today's story, John and the Great Fish. Then he goes out to witness to his friend. Jesus loves you. The Bible says so. His friend says the Bible isn't true. And then his friend asks questions. Guess what questions? Where did Cain get his wife? <laughs> well, how did the animals get, get uh, on Noah's Ark? And what about carbon dating? And, and so on. And he, he can't answer. So his friend says, see, the Bible's not true. So then he goes home and he asks his parents who take him to church. Hey, where did Cain get his wife? How, how do you explain dinosaurs? And guess what? The parents can't answer. And you see, what's happening is this. That child is having a foundation laid from, from his education and, and from uh, the media and so on, an evolutionary foundation, the wrong foundation that's being laid. You know, life is an accident, man evolved, and, and that sort of thing. And so therefore... When somebody starts to teach them about Jonah and the great fish and Paul's missionary journeys, they're just stories. The real world is millions of years. The real world is, is, is what he's taught out there in, in school and, and through the media. What a difference it would make if we laid that right foundation in, in, our, in our churches. God is creator and, and there's no millions of years and evolution's not true and help them understand the real history of the world and the Bible connects to dinosaurs and so on because then what happens when somebody comes along and starts teaching evolutionary concepts, they become the stories. You see that? And that's how it should be in our churches. In fact, we're trying to develop a Sunday school curriculum, uh, youth study curriculum, Bible study curriculum. In fact, I think any pastor, any Sunday school teacher, any Christian school teacher, any mum and dad, the way we teach should be after this pattern. I call it the seven C's of history. 
We start with creation, corruption, catastrophe, confusion, Christ, cross, consummation. There's the history of the universe from beginning to end. When we take something in the Bible, what we should be saying is this. Okay, the Bible says this. Where is the world attacking right now to undermine this? Then I need to answer that and teach people how to answer that. And then I need to show them how to defend what the Bible is saying and connect it to the real world. And then I need to teach the doctrine that comes from that. For instance, Adam and Eve. How does the world attack that? Ape men. Counteract the ape men. Okay, defend that we all go back to one man and one woman, and then what shall we do? Teach the doctrines that come from that, the doctrine of marriage, and apply that in the real world. You see what we're doing? Answering the attacks of the age, connecting the Bible to the real world, and then building the doctrine to apply it in your lives. We should do that every time we teach anything in the Bible. But we tend to teach the Bible just as Bible stories. There's one other aspect of creation, ev of creation evangelism, and it's in my book in more detail, and we obviously don't have time to do this, uh, in a program like this. I just want to allude, allude to it for you. And that is, we need a recognition that there are different sorts of people even within the one culture. Uh, there, there are people, yes, like, like the Jews, and there are people like the Greeks, and they're anywhere in between. And in the last section of my book, Creation Evangelism for the New Millennium, I go through some of these groups, and what I point out is this. You need to look at someone and say, hmm, which sort of group do they belong to? So, so what beliefs do they have so if they're, they're not building their belief, their, their thinking on the Bible, they've got inconsistencies. What are those inconsistencies? Let me deal with those in their presuppositions, the assumptions that they have, to point out the problems they've got, to open them up to listen to what I'm saying. And there are a number of different groups. There are people who have a Christian ethic but don't have the foundation of God's word. You need to point out their inconsistencies. There, there are kids who, who, who have been brought up in a, in a system that all is relative, there's no God. They don't understand that evolution is really foundational to, the, to their, their way of thinking and, and you need to somehow connect that. And there are ways, ways of doing this. And of course, then there are people in our culture uh, who are being brought up uh, in a sort of a new age type philosophy and how do you deal with them? Um, we need to understand these different groups and we need to know how to reach them. And as I said in my book, Creation Evangelism for the New Millennium, I do do that in detail and I'd like to see churches and Sunday schools, youth groups, Bible studies to, to go into that and study it in depth because once you understand where our culture's at and once you understand the gospel and the foundations of the gospel and once you know how to defend your faith and once you know how to connect the Bible to the real world, and once you know how to defend your faith and answer those questions that the world is asking, what a difference that's going to make in being an effective witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you very much. For more information on Answers in Genesis, call toll-free 1-800-350-350. 3232, or visit our website, answersingenesis.org. This video series was produced on the campus of Cedarville College, a creationist Baptist college of arts, sciences, and professional programs. For more information, call toll-free 1-800-CEDARVILLE, or visit the college website, cedarville.edu. pray you can all take out of this it's be able to connect the bible to the real world help people to understand that we do not have a blind faith do we the people that believe the bible is false that believe in evolution or, or believe in whatever else they're the ones of a blind faith who aren't seeing reality we don't have to shy away from the hard questions if we, if we look to God's word, do we? In fact, we should welcome the hard questions because that's our, our opportunity to show that Jesus has answers. Amen? God's word has answers. There's only one way you'll know those answers, to study, right? To know the answers. That's why we show these videos. That's why we've been talking about the things we've been talking about. That's why Jeff and Matt have preached the last two weeks 
about different false religions so that you can know how to witness to people who are caught up in these, not because we hate the people, but because they need Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ saved us, and he's commanded us to go out and make disciples. So we want to reach them wherever we can. And part of it, we need to understand, the Bible has the answers. We can't just act like people just only need to know uh, that, they, that Jesus died for their sins. A lot of people don't even know that they're sinners. They don't even have a concept of what sin is anymore. We have to explain it to them. We have to, we have to help them to build a Christian worldview. We have to prepare the ground. And that part of that is showing that the Bible is true, showing that there is such a thing as sin, and that you need to be saved. If they don't know what sin is, can they, can they take their sins to Jesus? If they don't even know what sin is? No. We have to connect the Bible to the real world. Hello, I'm Pastor Larry Evans, and you've been watching a New Life Church video. If it has been a blessing, please like, share, subscribe, and comment on it. We'd love to hear from you. Our website is www.newlifenwin.org and has our schedule as well as more information about us. God bless.